Hello, my friends. So when doing my research for potential challenge ideas, especially with more main game ones with theme decks, I got to thinking. The Pokemon trading card game for the Game Boy Color really does a great job at being a good translation of playing the game with the physical cards. Back when this game came out, the cards were seriously all the rage, and in some cases were almost impossible to get in stores due to them not being able to keep them in stock. So this game helped to satisfy those cravings for those who wanted to play and didn't have the cards they wanted to own, didn't have someone to play with, weren't able to obtain certain cards, whatever. The physical cards for many people were just collecting and trading. The GPC game was really only for playing the card game itself. But what's interesting is that they actually created many cards that were exclusive to the GBC game, and a lot of these ideas are a lot of fun. Many of the moves on these cards are meant to cause random chaos that could help or hurt either player. I love gimmicks like these in card games. Back when I was really into Magic the Gathering, my favorite deck ideas were ones that mess with or disrupt everything, especially in multiplayer matches. So what I want to do is take a look at these cards that were only meant to be found in the Game Boy Color game and its Japan-only sequel. I'm also a big fan of the artwork that they went with for these cards. And I will be mentioning the only two physical cards that didn't make it to the GBC. But the first thing I want to mention is the time period that the GBC game was released. December 1998 in Japan, April 2000 in North America and Australia, and then December 2000 in Europe. It only contains cards from base set, jungle, and fossil expansions, as well as promo cards, and, as we'll get into, exclusive ones. What I find interesting is that looking at the dates that the card sets came out in Japan, Base Set, Jungle, Fossil, Team Rocket, and Gym Heroes were all out before the release of the Game Boy Color game. But yes, of course, this is because they needed the time to develop the game and had to draw the line somewhere. They couldn't really stay up to date with the set releases up to the point of having this game finished. In regards to North America, the only sets you could get were Base Set, Jungle, Fossil, and Base Set 2 before the GBC release. The Team Rocket set was released two weeks after the Game Boy game and would end up being in TCG 2, although that was Japan only. So I mainly wanted to bring this up because it's so nostalgic to remember the covers of the booster packs you could buy in stores. Base Set had Venusaur, Charizard, and Blastoise. Jungle had Wigglytuff, Scyther, and Flareon and Fossil had Lapras, Aerodactyl, and Zapdos. It was almost intoxicating seeing that a store had some in stock with these glorious pictures staring back at you. I guess you had to be there. But also, like, you are going to need to shell out some serious cash to get one of these packs unopened nowadays, so I'm sure the intoxicating feeling is all too strong now, too. The Pokémon featured on the packages really didn't matter for what cards you get, as any from the sets were fair game. But because all of the sets get grouped into one big conglomerate of cards on the GBC, the packs are now different, and this is where I will go over the GBC exclusive cards. One type of booster pack you'll receive throughout the game are Colosseum packs with Pikachu on the front. These packs have 50 different cards in them all throughout base set and jungle, but there is one card included here that is exclusive to the GBC, Tangela. Colosseum Tangela is a grass type common with the moves Stun Spore and Poison Whip. I actually did use this in my Poison Moves Only challenge, and I found it to be an underrated gem. Stun Spore does 10 damage and can paralyze with a coin flip for only 1 energy, which can help you be able to use Poison Whip later, a 10 damage move with Auto Poison. Auto Poison is crazy good. As far as the artwork, I like it more than the base set version. I'm not a fan of that zoomed in picture, I don't know. But this card actually did find its way to get a physical release, only in Japan however. In 2001, there was a set of reprints of some of the past cards called Pokemon Web, and this Tangela made its way there. It was also in TCG2, now as an uncommon instead of a common. The next type of packs with 50 cards are Evolution Packs with Charizard on the front, containing cards from Base, Jungle, and Fossil. And there are two GBC exclusive cards here. First is Evolution Jigglypuff, and this one never got a physical card release at all, although the same artwork style is used on Erika's Jigglypuff in the Gym Challenge set. This Jigglypuff is a colorless common with the moves Friendship Song and Expand. Friendship Song is pretty unique. For one energy and a heads flip, you randomly place a Pokemon from your deck onto your bench. That's pretty awesome, really. Then Expand just does 10 and reduces damage done to it on the next turn by 10. It's a pretty cool card with some classic artwork here, and again, I prefer this artwork to the standard jungle version. The other exclusive here is Evolution Marowak. It's an uncommon fighting type with the moves Bone Attack and Whale. 
Bone attack does 10 damage, and your opponent can attack on the next turn with a heads flip. But Whale is the real unique one here. For 3 fighting, each player fills their bench with basic Pokemon chosen at random from their decks. What's cool about this is that it feels like one of the few Pokemon moves that can be linked with an actual deck strategy. If how you built your deck would benefit from having all benches full, Whale is a move that will shake things up. It potentially benefits both players. And yet again, I like the classic artwork here more than the jungle one. The next type of packs are mystery packs with Articuno on the front, containing cards from all three sets with three exclusive cards, each of the evolutions. These evolutions are interesting in that they only use colorless energies, except for Vaporeon. I'm not sure why that is, but let's start there. Mystery Vaporeon is an uncommon water type with the moves Focus Energy and Bite, two moves that exist in the main game. Vaporeon actually can't learn Focus Energy, but Eevee can, so just something random I wanted to point out. This Vaporeon is very similar to Jungle Scyther, weirdly enough. Scyther has Swords Dance and Slash, with Swords Dance meant to double the power of Slash on the next turn. Vaporeon's Focus Energy does the same for Bite. Hey, Paraspector the Editor here. So, as I was collecting images to use for the video, I noticed that in the game itself, uh, Vaporeon's Bite only takes colorless energies, even though the picture on the card taken from the magazine on Bulbapedia shows water energies. So, that's either a mistake or they meant for it to be water? I'm not exactly sure, but clearly it's colorless here. And like always, I love the artwork they used here for all three, actually. Mystery Jolteon is an uncommon lightning type with the moves Double Kick and Stun Needle. Double Kick is pretty standard with the 20 damage from two flips, and Stun Needle takes a whopping 4 energies to deal 30 damage and maybe paralyze. Yeah, Mystery Jolteon isn't turning any heads or anything. But hey, two double colorless energies can have you using Stun Needle in two turns rather than needing lightning energies, so there's that, I guess. Like with the Jigglypuff card, this artwork was also used for Lieutenant Surge's Jolteon in the Gym Challenge set. Mystery Flareon is also unique to the other three in that it has two attacks that each take three colorless energies to use, Bite and Rage. Bite just does 30, and Rage does 10 plus 10 more for each damage counter on Flareon, so you can always be doing at least 30 damage with the option of 40, 50, or 60 if Flareon has been hit. A very basic damage dealing card. It's kinda cool that these Eeveelution variants are more along the lines as if you had just evolved Eevee with their elemental stones and they haven't learned their special moves yet. That's probably what most everyone did in Red and Blue. You'll get your one free Eevee and then the stones are available to purchase in the department store in the same city. So it was easy to evolve Eevee within seconds with it only knowing normal attacks. So these variants kinda replicate that. The next main types of packs are Laboratory Packs, with Mewtwo on the front, with cards from all three sets, and now five exclusive cards here. Laboratory Ninetales is our first rare exclusive card, the fire type that never got a physical release, although the artwork is almost the same as Brock's Ninetales from the Gym Challenge set. This Ninetales has the moves Mix Up and Dancing Embers, and I have most certainly encountered this card in some challenges. Mix-up is pretty cool in that your opponent takes any basic or evolution cards in their hand and replaces them with random ones from their deck. That could certainly help you out by stifling their plans, or just as easily backfire on you. But Dancing Embers? Yikes. It does 10 damage for each heads on 8 flips. Yeah, it is a chore sitting there while you watch 8 Pikachu coins flip in the game every turn. This is such a take a chance card here. You don't know if you're dealing out anywhere from 0 to 80 damage in a turn, and you can completely change their Pokemon around if you want. It's a fun card. And also, yes, they spelled Ninetales wrong. Laboratory Magnemite is a common lightning card with the moves Tackle and Magnetic Storm. Tackle is super basic, it does 10 damage for 1 energy. Magnetic Storm is the unique one here. Remove and randomly reattach all energy cards on all of your Pokemon. Again, this is another move that is relying up to chance for it to help or hurt you. I'm a big fan of these cards that cause chaos in some way. It can also cause Magnemite to not even be able to attack if it doesn't get any energies on it. I'm a fan, but it's a risk. Next we have the colorless rare Pidgeot with its plumage on full display. It has the moves Slicing Wind and Gale. Slicing Wind sounds similar to Razor Wind and does 30 damage to one of your opponent's Pokemon at random for 3 energies. I actually love moves that can damage your opponent's bench, so this is a fun one. Gale does 20 damage for 4 energies, and then both Pokemon switch at random with one on their benches. 
And again, these moves with random effects are fun in concept, but you just don't know if it's going to help or hurt you. The last two before I get to the promos are two I saved for last for a reason. Let me explain. Laboratory Electrode is another rare, this time of the lightning type. It has Sonic Boom and Energy Spike, all using lightning energies only. Sonic Boom does 30 damage and ignores all weaknesses and resistances. Energy Spike works like an energy surge card, but even better. You search your deck for a basic energy and automatically attach it to any of your Pokemon. It doesn't deal damage, but it turns Electrode into a great setup card and can override ground type lightning resistances with Sonic Boom. This card was also released with a Pokemon web set in Japan. And finally we have Laboratory Ditto, a colorless type rare. It has the moves Pound and Morph. Pound does 10 for 1 energy, exactly the same as Tackle. Morph heals Ditto completely and then it becomes a copy of a basic Pokemon from your deck at random. This is a cool gimmick here and can be a way to get 5 or more of the same Pokemon in a deck even. It's way different than Ditto's signature move of Transform though, in that it copies one of yours at random rather than the Pokemon your opponent has. Which brings me to why I mentioned these two last. Out of all of the cards from base, jungle, and fossil sets, there are only two that didn't make it to the GBC. Base Electrode and Fossil Ditto. Apparently their Pokemon powers were difficult to translate to the GBC, so they made up entirely new cards for these Pokemon. Base Electrode is a lightning type rare with its only move being Electric Shock, which does 50 damage and then Electrode gets hit for 10 with a Tails Flip. But its Pokemon power is Buzz Zap. Buzz Zap causes you to knock out Electrode and it now becomes two energies of a type of your choosing to attach to one of your Pokemon. Now, I'm certainly no programmer or know anything about it whatsoever, but I'm a little surprised that this couldn't be adapted. Electrode basically leaves play and then two energies go onto one of your other Pokemon, and that's it. But alas, they chose not to use the card in the game for this reason. Fossil Ditto is a colorless type rare with it only having a Pokemon power and no moves. Transform causes Ditto to become an exact copy of your opponent's current Pokemon, which is very true to its main game gimmick. It has the same type, moves, weakness, resistance, and retreat cost, and any type of energy works for the energy the Pokemon it copies requires. Once that Pokemon leaves play, Ditto can become a copy of the next one. So while this one might sound more complicated to adapt than Electro does, it doesn't seem impossible. I mean, Laboratory Ditto copies one of your own Pokemon, so is it really that different to have it copy one of your opponent's Pokemon? But apparently so, because they chose to omit it from the game here. It's just pretty interesting to me that every card made it over here except for these two. So that about does it for all of the exclusive cards. Tune in next time for... Oh, right, I forgot about the ultimate amazing legendary cards that are so important. That's right, the entire point of your journey in regards to a story is to acquire the four legendary cards. I've joked a lot of them in my challenge videos about how meaningless these cards are to me, but to be honest, they're actually pretty cool versions. Each of the four legendaries all have one move and a Pokemon power. Jack's legendary Articuno's Pokemon power is Quick Freeze, which in my opinion is the worst of the four, but it could still come in handy. Basically, when you play Articuno, there is a 50-50 chance that your opponent's Pokemon gets paralyzed for a turn. In the game, Jack likes to do this and then use scoop ups to bring it back and do it all over again. Then its move is one that I love. Ice Breath does 40 damage to one of your opponent's Pokemon at random, ignoring weakness and resistance. I said before how I love cards that can damage benched Pokemon, it's just that this completely randomizes it. Legendary Zapdos is what Thunder Steve uses, and this is a dangerous one. Its Pokemon power is Pale of Thunder, which is when Zapdos is played, it does 30 damage to any Pokemon chosen at random other than Zapdos, even your own. Then its move is Big Thunder, which does 70 to a Pokemon at random other than Zapdos. Yeah, this one is all about taking the gamble. Dealing 70 for only 3 energies is quite strong, but you have no control over what happens. Most of the time, someone is going to be knocked out when this is used. And then we have my arch nemesis card itself, Courtney's Legendary Moltres. Its Pokemon power is Fire Giver, which is when Moltres is played, a random amount of 1 to 4 fire energies are taken from your deck to go into your hand. It's always so annoying when Courtney does this. Then its move is Dive Bomb, which does 70 damage, but only with a heads flip. So each of these birds have something that happens when you play them, and then they each take 3 energies of their corresponding types to essentially do random or chance damage. 
Articuno randomly damages one from your opponent, Zapdos does damage but nobody is safe, and then Moltres hits the active one 50% of the time. These certainly stay true to the random aspect that a lot of these exclusive cards have. But there's still one more legendary card, the actually not legendary Dragonite, used in Rod's deck. This Dragonite is also one of the three exclusive cards that later became a physical card, this time as one of the Japanese unnumbered promo ones. Its Pokemon power is Healing Wind, which is when Dragonite is played, all of your Pokemon get healed for up to 20. Pretty awesome for late game matches. Its move is Slam, which is a Dragonite staple. It does 30 damage for each heads on two flips. Honestly, it's a pretty basic card. Slam could end up doing zero damage, but what makes it good is its free potions for all of your Pokemon when it's played. I think my personal favorite of these legendary cards is the Zapdos card, just because it's so random and risky. I like chaos in card games, and nobody is safe when Zapdos is around. And finally, there is actually one more exclusive card, and this one is a tough one to get. In the game, there is a thing called Card Pop, where you can utilize the infrared scanner on the Game Boy Color to connect to someone else who owns the game, and you each get a card at random. You can only do this with somebody one time until you card pop with 15 different people, then the cycle can restart. But arguably, the most difficult card to receive in the entire game is what is called Phantom Promo Mew. There are two Phantom cards in this game, with the other being a Promo Venusaur, and these cards are only attainable through Card Pop. Since you can only Card Pop with somebody once, and especially with this game being over two decades old now, getting a legitimate Phantom Venusaur or Mew are incredibly rare. The Venusaur was actually a physical card release as one of the Black Star promos, but this Mew was not. This Mew has one single move, Mystery Attack. For one Psychic Energy, Mystery Attack does a completely random amount of damage and may or may not cause a random status condition. Yikes. Yeah, this is a pretty crazy card to get, and I've of course never seen one in the game. With emulation and mods and all that though, it's certainly possible to use it in a game, but I wonder how many legit copies out there have this Mew card in their game. The ultimate White Whale card, and it's very fitting that it's Mew. The only other ones I want to briefly mention that kinda count, kinda don't, are three cards. One is what is known as Playmat Promo Slowpoke, which was one of the unnumbered Japanese promos that never got an English release. So for English audiences, this was an exclusive card to the GBC. Another is the infamous Imakuni card, which was another unnumbered Japanese promo that actually did get a physical English release in 2016 with the generation set. Super Energy Retrieval is yet another Japanese promo, except this found its way to an English release shortly after the GBC game came out, in the Neo Genesis set in late 2000. And if you want to get real technical, I should also point out that there are two different types of artwork for the Promo Pikachu and the Surfing Pikachu. These are exactly the same cards to each other, just with some slight adjustments in the picture. The one Surfing Pikachu was an English release Black Star promo, but the other was yet another Japanese only promo, except this one has a volcano in the background. And like a green and white line. And the other Pikachu one has the traditional artwork for the Japanese promo. But the very, very last thing I need to mention, I swear this is the last one, is of course the Meowth with Cat Punch that came with every new copy of the game in North America. The original intent was for this card to be exclusive to the game, but was then found available in the February 1999 issue of Koro Koro Comic in Japan. So the intent for this was to be exclusive, but was instantly available as a physical card on day one for people who bought the English version of the game. But I believe that is it. It would have been cool to eventually get physical card releases for all of these, but in a way, it makes them more special to only be in this game. All of these cards were listed in the Japanese-only handbook called Pokemon Card Official Book 2000 that did have full color scans of these cards. So I guess if you wanted to get real crafty, you can take old Mr. Scissors to the book and make your own cards out of them, but who's doing that, you know? So thank you all for joining me in looking at all of the GBC exclusive cards. I've been enjoying making these side content videos involving the early releases of the cards. It's been a fun, nostalgic look back for me. I've also done some videos on the top 10 most main game accurate cards, top 10 things that bother me most about the cards, numerous challenges, an episode devoted to this game in my Pokemon retrospective, just lots of early Pokemon TCG content if you want more. A huge thank you to all of my Patreon supporters here. All of the links and the fun stuff are below, right underneath the subscribe button. I will see you all next time.
Paris Spectre will return.